Welcome to today's episode of One is Enough. I'm Samantha Hill, a Living Kidney Donor recipient and the Director of Marketing here at the NKR. And I am Michael Lalo, a Living Kidney Donor and the Chief Strategy Officer here at the NKR. Well, turnabout is fair play, right, Mike? Today's episode is your specialty, the donation process. The testing phase of donation can be so confusing for potential donors because there are so many different facets to it. It can also be kind of unnerving. I mean, we're talking about volunteering for major surgery. Yeah. So let's normalize the the process a bit and remove the guesswork from figuring out what is involved in getting medically cleared to to be a donor. Uh, We're going to be joined by an expert coordinator and living donor later, but first... Much as you took me back to my donation experience, I'm going to be taking you back, though certainly not quite as far, (laughs) to your donation experience so that we can do a deep dive on the workup and donation process. So let's begin. So can I just skip to our guest or do I have to? No, 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 no. This is your therapy session. Oh, I can't. So when did you donate and what first brought donation to your attention? That is a great question. So, uh... Back in 2018, while I was working as a detective with the NYPD, it was April, and um, we have something called an intranet. It's like a police website, if you will, NYPD website. And a flyer came over saying that there was a police officer named Tommy Alexander who uh, needed a kidney, and there was a telephone number, and they asked you know for people to call. And I've never, I don't know anyone who ever donated a kidney. I didn't know anyone that was on dialysis. The closest thing I I guess I knew to kidneys was my grandfather who had, I think, type 2 diabetes and took a pill and he was fine. Uh, so, you know, it was a fellow cop that needed help. I remember calling my wife saying, hey, there's a, you know, a cop that needs a kidney. You, like, should I call? She's like, yeah, sure. She's like, give me the number. She's like, I'll, I'll call too. Uh, so I called the transplant center and unfortunately uh, it didn't work out. Um, and that was it. I put it out of my mind, didn't get a phone call. I assumed the guy got a kidney and I went out with my life. That was April of 2018. And then in um, August of that same year, so about four months later, a New York Post article came out about a guy named Mark Weiner who had a billboard donated to him in Times Square. And um, so for whatever reason, it was just odd that I was alive for 46 years Never heard anything about kidney donation, and now twice in four months. So it was I, the year of the kidneys. They were haunting you. They were. Was twenty eighteen a good year for kidneys? Apparently, it was for you. I got to check the NKR stats and see how you guys were doing in twenty eighteen. Uh, I did good. Well, and, and so I was one. And I, now I'm, I'm giving the end of the story. But I hey, was one is enough. Oh, very good, <laughs> Samantha. Very, very good. So I attempted to donate to the gentleman for the billboard, and while I was waiting for um, the. Uh, the results to come back, I just did with our next guest is probably going to uh, cringe. I Googled about kidney donation and the process. And honestly, it it seemed like the impact to myself was so small compared to what it could do for someone. I couldn't find a compelling reason not to donate. And then I got the and phone. you were looking. I, yeah, I was. I did a lot, a lot of research. I read blogs and vlogs and and all these other things that I found. I watched YouTube videos. Um, I watched a couple of TED Talks. Uh, it was, I, I just tried, I really was like searching for an answer why I shouldn't do it. And I, I really couldn't find one. And then I was told that I wasn't a match. Um, and I asked the transplant center, well, I didn't know about the voucher program. So I just assumed I'd have to donate directly to him. I wasn't, I was told it wasn't a match. And that's when I asked the transplant center, could I donate um, as a non-directed donor, a good Samaritan donor. So uh, December of that year, 2018, I contributed one kidney uh, to the National Kidney Registry. I ultimately donated into the NKR. So at the end of uh, that year, December of 2018, I donated uh, as a non-directed donor uh, into the NKR. And you know what was interesting was I had the opportunity to donate to the wait list at the transplant center that I donated at, or I had one of the best coordinators, I think, in the United States of America. I'll give her a shout out. Marion Charlton. She's from, she will be on later. She's from <laughs> <Some> Ireland. <point. laughs> uh, and she gave me the uh, opportunity. Skinny? 
<laughs> yeah, well, so did the opportunity of either donating to their wait list or donating into NKR. And, you know, the NKR offers a lot of supports and protections for donors. Uh, there's also the opportunity to uh, do a chain, you know, so where it's not just going to one person, you can help multiple people. So ultimately, I made the decision to donate into the NKR. Great. Now, we have an expert on the donation process joining us in a bit, not Marion, but she'll be on a later episode, I'm sure. But what was the biggest hurdle you ran into when you were going through the workout? So there was no issues with my evaluation process. The issue that I had during my donation journey was really me. So it wasn't them, it was you? Yes, it was It was not them, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> and it was me because uh, when I was a little kid, I never liked getting blood taken. Uh, I had a bad experience at a uh, doctor's office and it like, messed me up for my my whole life. But as an adult, I've been pretty good, you know, getting like two or three vials of, of blood. So, um, and in the initial stages of the process, the NKR only asked for like three or four vials. I went to a Quest Diagnostics. So I thought I had this blood thing down pat. And when I went in for my full day of evaluation, the first person you see is the phlebotomist. I didn't know what a phlebotomist was. That's the person that steals the blood. From your body. Steals. Okay. We're going oh, with steals. I never got it back. So yeah, they they stole my blood from my body. Uh, so I'm sitting there and, you know, she's taking some vials out of the, the cabinets and I made the mistake of counting the vials. So, you know, it was like eight, it was like 10, it was like 20. And I'm like, what is she, like how many vials is she taking out of here? And she got to like 25 and now I could already feel my head kind of like, what is going on? This is a lot of blood. And I um, got to 25 and then she reached into the cabinet and took out three more. So it was 20 vials of blood. I'm like, holy mackerel. No big deal though. I was okay. So she starts to take the blood out. And when I got to vial number nine, I told her, I'm going to faint. And she goes, oh, honey, no, you're not. I said, oh, oh, I know myself. I said, I'm going to faint. And she's like, oh, no. So she pulls the, the needle out and she gives me some alcohol swab to put to my nose. And um, I go to get up and she's like, oh, don't do don't do that. And then <laughs> I remember waking up on a gurney uh, <laughs> and I said, oh, what, what happened? I fainted. They're like, oh, yeah, your eyes went back in your head oh my and, God. and all that stuff. So I, I was so embarrassed, you know, and I. I told the, the now like like the head nurse was there and I said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I messed everything up, you know, for the day. I guess I'll, I'll have to reschedule. And she said, oh, no, honey. She goes, you're not going to faint laying down. So she goes, we're just going to take the restroom while you're laying down here. I go, oh, OK. <laughs> oh yes. I remember part. texting my wife that I fainted and she just sent back a big OMG. They're probably putting a big rec a red X on your folder. <laughs> oh, you know, no. like this guy is going to get rejected. But. Ultimately, the fainting did not prevent me from donating a kidney. In addition to living through the donation process, you've guided other donors through it as well, correct? A couple, yeah. Yeah. And how does a potential donor go, go about finding somebody else who's donated to do that with them? So back in the day when I was donating so long ago, right, in 2018. That, that's not long ago. I was the long ago, Mike. You were like, you know, recent. Well, I'm old, though. I could say back in the day. Back in the day, 2018, there wasn't really a formalized national type of um, donor mentoring. So the hospital that I donated at, um, which was Wild Cornell, they had sort of um, ad hoc mentoring service. So Marion had some uh, donors' names written down on a basically on a piece of paper next to a computer that she knew were not like, you know, uh, crazy out there people. And, uh, you know, they would, she would give those donors out to donors that wanted to speak to someone that went through the process. But nowadays, uh, we have something called Donor Connect, which we, uh, the NKR created in, in conjunction with the National Kidney Donation Organization. So now we have a formalized process for people to speak to a donor uh, if they so choose. And how do they go about doing that? Oh, it's super easy. So when they go to start the process, whether it's through our website or one of the transplant centers website, um, they're able to, I don't know, I, mean, I, got, I got to figure out because it's, it's complicated to explain, actually. It actually kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> so the way someone goes about talking to a donor mentor is when they're going through the intake process, 
there's a, a description of the donor mentoring program, and they can either continue on, which would then uh, forward their information with their permission to a donor mentor, or if they didn't want to speak to someone at that time, they can click a little button that opts them out, and then nobody's going to contact them. Right, because it's not mandatory that you talk, talk to a donor. It absolutely is not mandatory. I personally highly recommend it, uh, but it is absolutely not mandatory, which is really cool is that um, the NCAR has enhanced that process because if someone doesn't feel comfortable talking to somebody in the beginning and then they start going through the process, they get sent to a transplant center and the coordinator thinks that, you know, it would probably be a good idea if you spoke to someone that um, that has donated in the past, they have the ability to connect them with one of those donor mentors uh, on their end as well. Let's just uh, go ahead and welcome our guests for today, the fabulous Kari Rancourt from Hartford Hospital, who donated her own kidney uh, through the NKR's Family Voucher Program this past January. Uh, since October 2015, she's helped grow the Living Donor Program at Hartford Hospital to more than double the volume. Yeah, Hartford's been absolutely one of the best hospitals we've been working with. They're really top tier. Um, she's passionate about educating patients, staff, and the nephrology community, and the public about living donation. She serves on the Operations Committee for the National Kidney Registry, the Medical Advisory Board for the National Kidney Foundation Connecticut, and as a co-chair of the Board of Directors for Donate Life Connecticut. Kari has also headlined a lot of our training events. She's a tremendous friend of the NKR, and I'm so glad that she was able to come down and join Absolutely. us for this. Well, Welcome. hello, and thanks for having me today. We are super excited I'm really excited because you are like a unicorn in the transplant world because you're a transplant coordinator, which is absolutely fantastic, uh, a very important part of the entire process. But you're one of the rare people in the transplant community that has actually, what is it, walk the walk, talk the talk, right? Mm -hmm. You have donated your kidney. and I sure did. And not that long ago, right? <laughs> Yep. Back in January, I became a non-directed donor utilizing so, the family voucher program. Oh, yep. well, we're going to probably definitely we have to get to, talk to about that. that too. Yeah. So can you share uh, your donation story? Why you decided yeah, to why donate? Did you, why did you decide to be one of the rare ones and, and donate? Um, I think it was more rare that I became a transplant professional because I graduated nursing school having no idea what I wanted to do with my career. And on a whim, I just accepted a position on the inpatient transplant floor and I just fell in love with it. It was awesome watching, you know, people come in so sick and then walk out of the hospital healthy again. And, and then it was just an incredible change. And so then I would, you know, be taking care of donors as well. And I thought that is a really cool thing to do. And I kind of told myself at 22, you know, I'm going to do that someday. And I knew definitely at 22, I was not ready to do that then. Um, but it, so it was always kind of in the back of my head. And um, I never thought I was going to stay in transplant as long as I did. Um, but one thing led to another. And since 2015, I've been working with living donors and it's just been amazing. It's such a good fit. And it's probably just because I've always wanted to donate and knew that that was in my future that you know, I found such a good fit in my role in our department as well. So you've been working in transplant since 2015? Well, since 2006. 2006. I've been working outpatient as the living donor coordinator since 2015. So why now? Yeah. What took you what, so long? What, what made you finally make the leap? Well, I wanted to have kids first. Um, even though I know it's perfectly fine to have kids afterwards, I just kind of wanted to get sure. that out of the way first. Um, make sure they didn't need any transplants themselves. Sure. There's no kidney disease in my family. There were no congenital issues. And then, you know, they're a little bit older now. They're four and seven. So, you know, it wasn't, you know, taking care of small children or babies at the time. And um, then I figured I'd do it before I got too old. And, you know, I, it was kind of that sweet spot, you know. I was healthy mm -hmm. enough to do it. My kids were big enough. Um it all just kind of lined up. Now, did you faint like Mike did? I did not. I've <laughs> have had, you had donors I, faint on you? I have had fainters, and they're almost always men. That makes so much sense. <laughs> well, we're, so what we're, was we're, the... we're big wimps. <laughs> you really are. <laughs> but, but I will say it is a lot of blood. So it's a lot. It, so I don't know if you heard me. Much. I don't know if you were well, listening earlier. It looks like a lot of blood. It's not so that much blood. Twenty-eight vials. That is like 
28 gallons of blood, right? No. Not even no. close, Mike. <laughs> no? It, it looks like a lot more when it's in the tubes than, like, if you were a weirdo that would empty them out. So you're saying it's kind of like when you're in a car and they, you have a, the little writing on the mirror that says objects in the mirror appear closer than they really are. Are you saying that the blood in the vial is... Appears it, larger it, than it appears is. Appears larger than it is? Yes. I'm not Here, buying it. Here's they, the thing. They took out 28 gallons. Mike... Mike, just talk to any recipient and see if they think 23 vials is that much. I guarantee you they'll be like, oh, that's a day in the park. Wait till you get the 50 or something. Oh, my God. But I do think like almost every donor is surprised by that first blood draw and how yeah. much there is. So I, I try to it's warn the, them about it. One <laughs> thing Marion Charlton did not tell me. She kept that from me. If She's, we're going to call her out this much, we're going to need to get her on here. We, we so will she eventually. can defend herself at the very oh, least. I will. I will. Her, the three of us will have a conversation for sure. So tell us specifically about your. So did you get any? Were there any hurdles for you if blood wasn't the issue? Not really. I mean, my biggest hurdle was also myself. Um, so more just trying to tear myself away from my desk long enough to be worked up. You'd think it'd be easy because I donated at my own center, but you know. You guys keep me so busy that trying to get away from my desk. You can't help but you're a really good center. We have to give you <laughs> kidneys, which I appreciate. And so I will take that challenge. Uh, but we yeah, put them somewhere. I think it was just um, trying to be comfortable with the time off of work and things like that to, um, you know, get through the evaluation. We typically do it at our center in one day, but I broke mine into two pieces just so that I could not take time off of work. Mm -hmm. Does that so that's typical one day or is two days more common? So one day is typical for us. Um, one of the big challenges I'm sure you guys are aware of is, you know, not every transplant center does these evaluations in the same setup. And um, we typically offer it as a one day evaluation, but sometimes that doesn't work for donors. And so we can be flexible and we can split it up if that's easier for someone. Mm -hmm. So before we get into a little bit more detail about the testing, you know, you said that you were a donor. Did you, who did you donate to? I donated to someone through NKR. I know it went to a child in Minnesota. Um, that's about all I know. So you never got in contact with your recipient? Not yet. I mean, it's only been, I think, eight or nine months. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, post-transplant, oh, yeah. you know, you got a lot oh, going yeah. on. Especially, you're adjusting to everything. So. Especially if you're a peed. Yeah. 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 I mean, the yeah. parents are taking care of that kid. Pretty Samantha, yeah. and so Samantha I think, would know. Yeah. Yes, I did. I was there. And, as, and so I think it's, it's nice for me to be able to have that mm -hmm. knowledge of what it looks like post as well. So that, you know, I'm perfectly okay. I went into this knowing, like I was putting this out there with no expectations, um, no plans for anything and and so that was that was my path so but you also donated as a voucher so you technically also donated on behalf of whom my children and my husband mm -hmm. and my parents okay. and oh and my brother i i went over i did six and what is that program <laughs> called that is the family voucher program <laughs> excellent kari that was a test and you have passed yes yeah, so you, you get a gold star i spend a lot of time educating people about vouchers so oh in that case we might need you back <laughs> i'm sure at some point right maybe yeah. oh definitely that's on the list for 2024's topics so one of the most common types of questions that we get as mentors i used to be a mentor uh, a long time ago back in the day samantha uh, our medical questions, but yours is your back in the day is like the sixties. Mine is like the twelve forties. Oh, I was born in seventy two, not the sixties. <laughs> uh, but a critical pillar of the donor mentor program is that mentors cannot and do not offer medical advice as they are not medical professionals. I clearly am not, but Kari, you are. So, I ask you this: What can a donor expect from the process medically, and what are the tests and how long does the whole process take? I know we, we talked a little bit about uh, that already with Samantha, but if you can go over the like the actual testing process, the actual exams that are going to be performed, that would be very helpful, I think, to our million listeners. Or the one guy in his basement, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so, yeah, so walk us through the evaluation process and the, the actual tests that are performed. Sure. So... Um 
you know, medically, I guess at the most simplest terms, a donor can expect to have the best physical of their life. And um, how much does that cost? That is at the very low cost of zero dollars. Zero dollars? Why is that? Because donating a kidney shouldn't cost you anything more than a kidney. So you know, who pays for all the testing that you're going to talk about in a minute? Either the transplant center or the recipient's insurance. Um, you know, we have a whole financial team that sorts that out for me, and I would not be able to do my job without them. Um, cool. But it is all taken care of by either the transplant center or the recipient's insurance. That's awesome. So tell all these donors what they're going to win by going through the evaluation process. Um, yeah. So like I said, best workup of your life. Um, so for us, we typically start with just some education and screening over the telephone um, with one of our coordinators as the very first step, just to, you know, outline the process, explain some of the risks and benefits, um, really explain what you can expect and what the testing looks like and what the options are. Because um, there's, in addition to having that medical workup, there's also a lot that every donor needs to know about this to make a truly informed decision. So we sprinkle that education throughout. As long as there are no major red flags on our screening, then we have our folks do all that lovely blood work that you described. Um, in addition to that, we do a 24-hour urine collection, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's 24 hours of collecting your urine. Correct. Yeah. It's That's really yeah. fun. It is. <laughs> it is not as easy it's at, really not. No. 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 And, not even and you for get, a guy, apparently. And you well, get the, nervous. That too. part is easy, but you know, you you gotta have the jug with you everywhere. Right? Because including you, in your workplace. Including your workplace. Because well, well, you I, have to collect the urine. I did it at home, you weird. <laughs> no, I, I brought it to work. <laughs> okay. I'm not what am I gonna take twenty four hours off of work to go pee in a in a jug? You I could use a weekend. I, I did it on a Sunday. I, no, see. I did it a lot differently. I started it on a Sunday knowing that I'd finish at work on Monday and then I wanted to not like, you know, go to Quest on the on a weekend. So I I took it with me on my way home and dropped it off at Quest. <laughs> but, so so let me offer you this. You know, and start it Sunday morning. Yeah. And go to Quest before you go to work on Monday morning. No, I, yeah, but That's I, I, I used to. much smarter. Yeah, but I, I couldn't it's have like done I've that. It's like I've been doing I couldn't go. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. I couldn't do that. I started at 2.30 in the morning. You know, the best. That's a weird. That's point. another. Yeah. I, okay, never mind. Michael's bathroom so, habits are a completely separate episode of, but, of this. Right. And only Maybe available you get your on Reddit. Maybe checked. <laughs> 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 All right, so go ahead. They do the 24-hour urine. No, no, no. I think we're still on this. Yeah, we've actually, we used to require 24-hour urine with our pre-test pre work. Yes, I remember. Yes, we're sorry. Um, <laughs> everybody should see the look she's giving me. It's one of pure hatred. Um, but anyway, we had people like very confused by this. Yeah. We also had people with really intense kidneys who would walk into Quest with like empty milk cartons and the jug and yeah. a water bottle. And it was yeah. like, here's all of it. And it's like, <laughs> what the hell? You said 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So if you can pass that first step of <laughs> successfully collecting 24 hours worth of urine. Which apparently uh, is also an IQ test. And then... Do all that blood work without yeah. fainting. Uh, oh, they don't care if you faint, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep going. <laughs> so then, as it, for our center anyways, if, you know, all that comes back normal, the next step is to come spend the day with us in the office. So that's going to consist of an hour one-on-one -on -one with the coordinator, um, more education about the process, what the options are. Um, it's about an hour with a nephrologist, um, really going over their individualized risk, medical history, family history. And a nephrologist specializes in kidneys, Kidney, right? yep. It's a medical doctor that specializes in kidney health. Right. Um, we also have everyone see a social worker just to make sure they have, you know, the right supports in place and, and there are no major concerns, you know, psychologically. We have everybody see a donor advocate as well who is um, literally just there to advocate for the donor if they need someone. We have everyone see a dietitian to really go over, you know, what their um, dietary habits are, if there are any, you know, changes they need to make. Sometimes people need to lose a little weight to qualify, so they can also help uh, offer some resources with that. 
which is a whole nother episode. Want to make sure I'm not forgetting anyone or they'll be offended. Um, oh, and a surgeon. We do like to have somebody see it. Everyone <laughs> well, see a surgeon. They'll be attended. Just, so it's yeah. not just a guy with a melon ball or good yeah. to know. Well, no, we, we do often say, you know, on the evaluation day, it's not uncommon for us to skip the surgeon if if they're tied up in surgery or things like that. They're a little bit more important at the pre-op yeah. visit. I mean, who wouldn't want to meet the person that's going <laughs> to cut open their body and take the kidney out? Well, they will at the pre-op visit. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, but at least evaluation day, as long as there are no surgical concerns, you know. So we do an EKG, we do a chest X-ray, we do a CAT scan is really important. Why? Well, we want to make sure you already have two kidneys to start. What? And that how could... actually, that actually knocked my father's father, my my paternal grandfather, out of donating a kidney to me. He still tried because he was crazy. But, you know, I, I love him dearly. God rest his soul. But uh, he had actually lost a kidney in a, bo- in a boxing accident when he was in college. Wow. And so he he, did, he had no idea that it was too da- that it was damaged beyond repair because it was, you know, the like 50s when he yeah. was in college, but um, or 60s. And you know, they just left it. They didn't do anything to him. So it was still in there. It was, it was still just in there. and scarred. Yeah. And so he was like, wait, I only have one that works. Oh, wow. never knew that. Cool. Did, have you had people who were born with only one did not know and then the CAT scan revealed that? Have you had that? Because I, I, I actually I spoke to one of them. I personally have not, but I, I, I've heard of plenty of those. Yeah. I, I spoke, I was mentoring someone that was a, an older person and um, they called me up to tell me that they wouldn't be able to donate and I said, oh, my gosh. I'm like, why? They said when they did the CAT scan, I only have one kidney. And they said that it's, you know, back in the day, uh, before my day, uh, you know, they didn't have all these fancy uh, ultrasounds and sonograms and all this stuff. So they didn't, you know, now they check for all the the, the organs. They just, yeah, you got a baby in there and then the baby is born. So he had no idea that he only had one kidney. Yeah, it yeah. can happen. It's a sign that you can live. One is enough. One is enough. <laughs> um, all right. What other tests can donor ex- donors expect? So yeah, CAT um, scan was we. Yeah, we CAT did scan. CAT scan. Um, you know, depending on their medical history or or their you know lab results, we may ask them to do additional testing. So a pretty common one for some folks is to see a cardiologist for right. clearance. Maybe do some cardiac testing along there. Um, for us, if somebody has a history of smoking, we like them to do pulmonary function tests. Um, what about for um, for men like over a certain age? You require a colonoscopy. Well, men and women require. Oh, both men and women. We both, we both have poop. colons. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this is turning into it's like a, a, a biology. Uh, uh, this is why Mike's not the medical episode. expert. No, <laughs> yes. you know, it, this is why I, we don't I, let mentors speak on medical stuff. I heard I'm up for nomination for the medical board, so maybe this, I wonder <laughs> I if it's going to help or hurt. This is going to cancel that nomination, Mike. <laughs> so okay, so men and women so, colonoscopies. Yes, when when would they do, have to get that? We do that? require folks to be up to date on routine cancer screenings. So okay. uh, I think the latest. Well, yeah. Like so that. whatever the latest thing that the American sure. Cancer Society is recommending, that's okay. what we align with. So for us, colonoscopy start at 45, um, you know, mammograms, pap smears. We don't necessarily require people to be up to date to start the testing, but right. we do let them know that, you know, you do have to get these things done in order to donate. Cool. All right. What else we got? What else do we have? Um, So if we see anything abnormal, we'll send people to see specialists all the time. Normally, who pays for those specialist trips? We do. It's still free. Now, we don't often pay for the colonoscopies and the mammographies, that sort of thing, because it is routine health care and that's covered covered under under your own major insurance insurance company. Correct. Correct. And if there's a a barrier, if that's like the one thing that's stopping somebody from being able to donate, um, we would, of course, see if there's any way we can help out. So it doesn't really come up anymore. What's the weirdest test you ever sent anyone for? I don't know if I can think of weirdest. It's just, I think sometimes I get these you know, obviously healthy people that it's just yeah. one thing after the other after the other. Um, and so, you know, for example, if you're going to see your primary care physician for a routine physical and your blood counts are just slightly abnormal and you have no history of anything, they'll say, hmm, that's weird. Let's see what it does next year. Right. Whereas with donation, we don't have that luxury. So, you know, we'll jump and send somebody to see a hematologist and that often goes down a rabbit hole that often ends in a bone marrow biopsy and things like that. You wow. Know, really, really leaving no stone unturned because we, you know, donor safety is our number one priority. So I will have people do 
everything under the sun so that we can confidently say that this is safe for you to do. Wow. That's fantastic. And it makes sense because, I mean, this is major surgery we're talking about. And you want to make sure that this person is not going to be negatively impacted Correct. by having only one. So, yeah, because I can't think of another person walking into a hospital completely healthy saying, perform a procedure on me. Well, right, certain so. housewives and nose jobs, but <laughs> I, we I, might I, need to cut that. I must go there. <laughs> Plastic surgery was not even on my list of things. <laughs> I oh mean, my liver goodness. donors. Liver donors do do that the, as well. well but, organ donors. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah the very rare does someone walk into a hospital and say, you know, take my kidney, take my liver, please. Uh, Perform a major operation where, yeah. you know, I can't return to work for several weeks afterward. And, you know, I, I've, you know, I'm, you've had this, I'm sure, you know, um, having donors go through the evaluation process. I've talked to to donors who were crushed that they, you know, found out um, medically they were, you know, ineligible, but, and maybe they're trying to even help a loved one, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're going to do a direct donation, not like a, a Good Samaritan donation that you did. And they, they almost want to, I just spoke to someone recently that, that said, I'll sign a waiver that you could do an open nephrectomy that you, it's like, just take my, take my kidneys so I can like help my, my family member. And, you know, I told the donor, I said, they're never going to do that. They're, they're never going to allow someone to donate if they're not going to leave the hospital perfectly healthy minus one kidney. Correct. And, you know, I, I have had to have a lot of those difficult conversations with people who really, really want to donate. I've had plenty of people offer to sign that same waiver and, and sure. you know, say whatever they can do um, to, to have that they don't care about the risks. And, I always have to remind them that we do and, you know, it's a risk for them. And also if something negative were to happen, that could impact donation sure. overall. Even if yeah, they yeah. sign off on it, we want to make sure that, you know, when people like Samantha need a kidney, that we have a system where, sure. they, can, yes, please. They, where they can get <laughs> one and that, you know, yeah. we, we didn't do something that, that shut the whole thing down. Is there um, a, a common thing that would prevent someone from donating a kidney in, in your experience? Um, I mean, diabetes is usually a big one and, you know, cancer obviously is a big one. But what I find a lot of times is it's not always one big thing. Sure. It's a lot of little things that kind of add up to um, many risks. And so we're always trying to see how we can get over those, how we can safely get somebody across that finish line. Um, but it always has to come from that perspective of safety. So is there anything that could rule a donor out initially, but maybe they can do something to fix it so they can ultimately donate? Um, yeah, I mean, not every every rule out is reversible, but I mean, we've had one where somebody had a large kidney stone and, and they went and took care of it with the urologist and came back and um, they were low risk for forming more. So we said, sure. Um, you know, again, with the weight, sometimes people don't sure. qualify if they're, you know, at a higher BMI. Um, maybe they're starting to show some signs of metabolic syndrome, but they can, you know, adopt a healthier lifestyle and make some changes and come back. I, I, that's the biggest one we see people that because it's modifiable. What about smoking? Is that would that preclude someone from donating? Um, obviously, should they? I've heard stories that you guys recommend that they stop certain amount of time before and don't smoke a certain amount of time after. Can you answer the smoking uh, question? So that's one of those things that is very center specific. Yeah. So every center has their own uh, policies and guidelines on, on, you know, what they will do with smoking. We do require folks to quit um, because it can impact your kidney health to some degree. It can, you know, increase your overall risk to kidney or to develop kidney disease. So we do require people to stop smoking um, and we have resources in place to help them with that if they need that help. Um, but ultimately afterwards, they're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. What I think you, about you, alcohol? Oh, you know, it's funny. That's up there is probably number one thing that I, I get asked, like, can I still drink? Yes. Well, we know what people... But alcohol is still bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, alcohol, you know, we're taking a kidney, not a liver. But, you know, in general, we are looking at things to make sure you are 
using and not abusing. You know, alcohol use disorder is not good, sure. you know, if you're going into a stressful situation like this. But if, you know, you like to have, you know, some drinks on the weekend, like, I'm not taking that away from you. And you do have to see a, a psychologist and pass a psyche eval, correct? Or you have to. No? You have to see. You have to have a psychosocial eval. So oh. for some centers, that means psychologist. Uh, for a lot of us, it means a social worker. Mm -hmm. And then if there are further concerns, we may ask somebody to see the psychologist. Because yes, we are looking not just at medical safety, but also their psychological safety. Um, you know, donation is a stressful thing, and we know that people do experience some depression and anxiety throughout it. And so we want to make sure, not that we're going to rule people out, but we want to make sure that they have the support in place to withstand those stressors sure. and that, you know, they they are aware that that could happen. You know, you mentioned, I think where Samantha mentioned earlier that you're uh, here uh, as a transplant coordinator from Hartford Hospital. And the, the process that you described is the process at your transplant center. Correct. And I think you just mentioned that you know, I think in the United States of America, there's like 259 transplant centers, the NKR. A really specific number, Mike. I just saw the but number. But he thinks. I, did, he I saw, thinks I saw the number yesterday, <laughs> so I think it's still 259. And the NKR has 102 transplant centers that are in our network. Every transplant center has a different process, right? So the process that you described is specific to your center. A lot of it, I think, was, was general, but each transplant center, because we could be I have a list. We we could have listeners from all over the country, and they could be going to a transplant center in California or Florida or Chicago, wherever they are, and the experience might be a little bit different, right? Correct. You know, we all have these standard tests we have to perform, but the way we structure that is different center to center. We all also have our own cutoffs um, based on our own experiences and you know comfort level. Um, so there there are definitely you know, things that vary center to center, but it's usually, you know, similar type setup to what we do at Hartford. Cool. Yeah, what I was going to actually inject a little bit was that if you are ruled out at one center, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be ruled out at another one. True. Correct. Very true. And it's definitely a question worth asking because usually the centers kind of know who's who a little yeah. bit and who will allow what. And plus, you know, there are always trials going on for different things. Mm -hmm. uh, so... You know, and we'll probably have some guests on for all of them at some point, hopefully, if we stay on the air. But, um, you know, there's, uh, I think it's called either the HOPE trial, the new HOPE trial that's HIV positive to HIV positive. Right. I know that's going, out, Don, that's going on at NYU, um, at the very least in a couple other centers. So it used to be that that would completely preclude you from donating. And now there are certain places where you can. So it's definitely worth talking to your center if you even if you are ruled out. Absolutely. And, um, you know, asking around and finding those other centers are helpful. If if I rule someone out um, and I'm aware of another center that's somewhat nearby, ideally, that that might be able to work with them, um, I won't hesitate to reach out on their behalf. All right. So on that note, uh, is there anything else before we conclude uh, and thank everybody uh, that you'd like to tell a potential donor or somebody working through the process who might be a little stuck or um, as, a, as both a donor and a transplant coordinator? The unicorn. So, so you please stop calling her a unicorn. <laughs> so the big thing I, I often will say to anyone who's listening, who's considering donation is to ask questions. So I know you said that you shouldn't be Googling things. I did. Um, you should not Google your own medical results, but it's perfectly fine to Google the donation process um, to get that information because there is actually a lot of good information out there now. It didn't always used to be that way. Um, you guys have done a great job of putting a lot of a lot of helpful information out there. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We try. There are some very helpful Facebook groups out there as well. Um, so there are a lot of ways where people can get connected to good information. Um, but yeah, don't Google your own results because that's a... You'll end up with like 17 different cancers yes, and like a death sentence. Yes. Don't play Dr. Google, but get that information about the process, comparing the centers. Um, that's always encouraged. And if you have to go to different specialists, or you have to do these extra steps... Don't get discouraged. That means you're not ruled out yet. Um, it means we're trying everything we can to make sure that this is safe for you. Um, so just stick with us on the journey. I've had people get through it in about two weeks, and I've had some people take, you know, 
a year or two to wow. do the whole mm-hmm. piece. So everybody's different. And if we're asking you to do more steps, it means there's a chance. Right. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Kari. Um, we want to thank you for not just uh, just this podcast, but just for being um, such a help and advocate for the NKR. I'm Absolutely. sure that we're going to need you again for more training events and more discussion topics. Um, Especially if our posts. ratings jump up because we had the unicorn on the show. We are definitely bringing her back. My God, can we please stop well, using the it's, unicorn? <laughs> it's my pleasure. It's always fun and, and it's been great working together. So I hope to continue. Oh, we, we hope so too. I mean, you've authored bunch of our blog posts as well. I mean, you're one of our, our go-tos because you're so willing to help us. And so we we thank you very, very much for that. Um, we wouldn't be able to do as much as we do without you. And we also thank Hartford Hospital for allowing you to be such a, such a great help and such a great friend of the NKR and for allowing you to join us today on One is Enough. Well, thank you. We recognize as long as there's good information out there, the patients are better educated And if I can help teach other coordinators, then the whole system works better as well. So it really is a win-win. And that's the goal of this podcast. I mean, we just want to try and get that correct information out there because there are the false starts out there. And, you know, Dr. Google is a thing and it's not always the correct information. So that's kind of what we're trying to do here. So thank you. Awesome. You can learn more about the podcast by visiting kidneyregistry.org slash one. When you're there, you can sign up to be on our email list so that you'll be the first to know when we drop a new episode. And trust me, you want to be the first to know.